We're continuing today in a kingdom response. Now, last week, our last session, we had shared lots of things about what I think God's getting ready to do. And all you have to do is turn on the evening news to find out just how squirrely and crazy the world's getting. While Islam is seemingly taking over everything, our government sets up anti-terrorism units that target veterans and Christians and those who believe in the Constitution. And so we, we need to look at this response. Now, one of the things that I shared last week when I read from Revelation 3 is that when God began to deal with these things, he said, I'm going to open up doors that no man can close. And what I have seen in the last two weeks is God beginning to open up some doors that uh, Mary and I are scrambling on how in the world are we going to do it all. Just to be real honest. And it's going to be by the grace of God. You know, if folks here just realize how much we have tried to cram into 3,000 square feet. And uh, to be truthful, I'm already working over my head because there's a chance that we may be able even to be able to move to streaming podcasts where it's going to be streaming video and then archived in audio. And I'm thinking, well, for us to do that, we really need to put this pulpit on wheels and be able to roll it over here. We need to have another set that we need to build to bring in this place. We need some lighting. And it's like, ay, yeah, yeah, Lord God. <laughs> At the same time, it's exciting. And uh, I don't know what, how, how fast we're going to be able to implement all of this, but I've already begun believing God for a 10,000-square-foot building that we can have real shipping and to be able to have two different video studios, a uh, radio for radio and podcast studio, the production area for the school, and then probably a shipping area as big as what we have right now is what I see coming. And so we're pressing into God and begin to see God just do stuff and put stuff on people's hearts that's uh, really kind of amazing. And I stand at all at all that he's doing. But you know, one of the things I want to deal with today as a part of this kingdom response, in the same light that, you know, with, with everything Mary and I are doing, we're actually having to rework everything. There's a lot of stuff getting set to the wayside that we, we can't afford to do anymore. It's, it's not productive for the kingdom. We're also realizing that there's only so many hours a day that you can stay awake and stay focused. You know, I, I had emailed Josh Peck this week and told him, you know, if it wasn't for eating and sleeping, I'd probably get a, really a whole lot more accomplished. And so we're having to weigh things and set aside things to make room for new things and analyzing the way that we're doing things to, to make it more productive. And I think at this, in the same way, right now, the body of Christ, those the, that are the remnant, we're looking at how that this world is plunging into darkness. We're looking at how this iniquity force that, that flows from the heart of Lucifer is in ascendancy right now in the hearts and the minds of citizens of Babylon. And our response has to be we've got to press more into God. If the world is pressing into iniquity, we need to press into biblical holiness. And I guarantee you that if the world is going one way, that 99.9% .9 of the time all you have to do is, is walk the opposite way and you're going to find yourself with God. It has become so horrendous. But we just can't sit and twiddle our thumbs. This is the time to press into God because this is the time that God can empower us and change us. And I'm, I tell you what, we have got to do a lot of things. I wrote in my book just about TV. Uh, we were listening to uh, Steve Quayle was on Alex Jones last night, or yesterday, we listened to it last night. 30 years ago, he was actually taken in through the hallowed halls of DARPA and where he could actually see some of the projects they had going on. Of course, some of them were classified areas, but they had signs on the door. And he said, what's interesting is 30 years ago, they were absolutely consumed with different frequencies that can be broadcast over television for use in PSYOPs 30 years ago. Now, he presented an article that these people say, you know, it's amazing that television, the particular frequency and the resonance and, and all these different things are involved with it, it puts you in a hyper-alpha state. It turns you into a zombie. 
basically. And the writer says it's amazing that of all these frequencies that were available for television, that it, that it just happened to fall on the one that created this alpha state. Hmm. When 30 years ago they were consumed by it. And I just wonder how much of, with the evolution of television, going to digital versus analog, I think is more than the government just wanted the bandwidth. I think they found out it was more effective. There's some things we're going to have to unplug from and not have a constant feed of. But at the same time, you've got to replace it with something else, don't you? How about replacing it with kingdom? Right now, there is such a proliferation of podcasts dealing with the kingdom of God and dealing with issues that sometimes I think just to keep up with stuff, I could almost listen 10 hours a day just to keep up with all that is happening right now. And so there's this reprioritization that's going on. And I also think part of this, pre, uh, this uh, uh, readjusting things is we've got to learn the stratagems of the enemy. And I thank God in his sovereignty in the seven letters to the seven churches in the book of Revelation shares many of the strategies that the enemy uses to contaminate, to pollute, to put the church to sleep, to make it to where it's not effective, to get it off base. He does all of that and they're encoded now in the book of Revelation. There, there are many theories to these seven letters. Yes, it was the seven actual churches that existed in that day. But many have tried to hypothesize that it was seven stages of the church until the Lord comes back. And I think that may and may not be true. But what I do see is in those seven letters, God gives us the basic tactics that the enemy uses to destroy our spirituality, to destroy the effectiveness of the church. And we are not to be ignorant of his devices, but once we discover what they are and to begin to build safeguards against them, we can become that victorious church. It's part of our pressing into God. We've got to be like Christian in the Pilgrim's Progress when you get that burden off your back then God gives you a spiritual backpack that you're supposed to be putting stuff in and don't let the devil weigh it down with his stones of doubt and his stones of, 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 of things that, that try to weigh us down. We're supposed to lay aside every weight that so easily besets us. The only thing allowed in your kingdom pack are things sent to you from the throne of your king. Everything else has to go to the wayside. And one of the first things that we run across, and I'll, we could sit and read all seven letters. I don't want to take time to do that, but I kind of want to skim over them this morning. The very first church, they had lost their first love. Now, a lot of, right now, a lot of people in the body of Christ, they go to church every week. And they, I mean, they're, by, by outward appearance, it just appears like, Man, everything's going great, but there has been a transition in the body of Christ. You see, I remember when I first got saved, and I've seen guys, man, when they really get saved, all of a sudden they discover how awesome Jesus is. They discover what he did for them, and, they, and, they, and out of gratitude and love for him, they're wanting to get into the word to see how to please him. It's all about him. You go to church because you're going to sing hymns about him. They want to hear about the cross. They want to hear about the ways of God. They want to hear about what Jesus accomplished for him so that they can live a life that is glorifying to him. Now, somewhere along the way, there's been a transition. It's not about what can I do for him because of what he has done for me. We have transitioned to what have you done for me lately? And we have turned Almighty God into a vending machine that we put so much in, and I'm going to reap my 100 full return, and I can press the buttons and tell God what he's going to give me. You have left your first love. If all God ever does for us is go to the cross and receive all of our wrath, all of, all, all of God's wrath and sin in our behalf so that we can be saved and born again and end up in heaven, that was enough. That one act alone that took him 4,000 years to, to get to the place where he could come and, and dwell in human flesh and take our place on the cross. 
that in itself should cause us to be devoted to him for eternity. If you understood the reality of hell, if you understood the reality of iniquity that was dwelling in your bosom, and how he came to set you free, that is more than enough to serve him the rest of our lives. But instead, we have left our first love because somehow or another our, that first love has come back around and it's all about me. I've got an interview with Dr. John Gar. I'm going to release her in a couple of weeks. And he says, you know how they, you have the different notes, you know, soul, you know, in the dough and it goes on through. He says, somehow or another, the body of Christ is just stuck on me. He said, if you could step back and listen to what they were saying, it's me, 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 me. Yeah, and they give me the dough so I can take care of me. <laughs> I have to share that one with him. <laughs> it's not about us, it's about him. And it has gotten so bad right now in the body of Christ that people are basically teaching with the way that they're teaching hyper grace is that the cross no longer changes us, it changed God. I've shared this before, but there, there's a book out there called The Shack, and it's an abomination. And I was, and then they're trying to figure him out. These guys are researching. Uh, many believe he's more of a, a universalist. But I mean, it took Christianity by storm. It started out with God the Father was a woman. How many know that ain't right? That, that's Ozarkian way of saying that is not right, just for you grammar, you, know, you grammar police out there. I'm from the Ozarks. We have our own way of communicating. It's not right. But what this guy said, he said, because he said, now do you believe that the wrath of God was poured out upon Jesus on the cross? And he said, no, I believe the wrath of man was poured out upon Jesus on the cross. And I'm thinking that is the most blasphemous thing I ever heard because the theological consequences of that belief is man didn't mess up in the garden, God did. And so God had to take human flesh so man could pour out his wrath upon God for God's error. Now, theologically, we would say in the Ozarks that that dog does not hunt. That is so in error that it is unbelievable. Jesus took the wrath that belonged to us, that God in his righteousness had a right to pour that wrath on a, on a, on a creation that had rejected him, that had abandoned his ways, that committed high treason against him. And he loved you and I enough to come and to take that burden on us. I did a podcast that's going to share this, that's going to be released this Sunday with Omega Frequency. And one of the things that came up out of my spirit in the Garden of Eden, if you want to put Genesis chapter 3 in uh, today's English, Adam and Eve messed up. God looked at it. He told Eve, I got this. I'll fix it. He did. He fixed it. It took him going to the cross. He bore that sin and that shame upon the cross, even though he was the one that was wounded. He was the one that was done wrong to. He said, I'll fix this. If that, and so the, the Bible says, go back and do the works of, of the first works again. What's that? To fall back in love with Jesus. I don't change him. He changes me. And everything that I do is about trying to become more compatible and to be more like him. I'm supposed to be compatible with him by what the Holy Spirit's doing in my life, and I am to seek a life that glorifies him and honors him. It is not about me. It's not about you. I'm supposed to be crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet it's not I. It's Jesus living through me. And if, we, and if we lose sight of that, we lose sight of everything about the kingdom. And we disconnect ourselves from the things of God. The second thing, and it's interesting because when you read through the seven letters, you talk about the Nicolaitans and you talk about Balaam and you talk about Jezebel. They're different. 
And so we need to watch out for the Nicolaitans. Now, I did a little bit of research on the Nicolaitans. Adam Clark in his commentary on First and Second Peter. You see, Peter wrote part of his, uh, his pastoral epistles there because of what the Gnostics were doing. And Adam Clark says that it is well known that the Nicolaitans were a sect of the Gnostics of that era. And so the apostle Peter says, you think you have revelation. I was there at the transfiguration. Top that, Jack. But yet we have a more sure word of prophecy, the word of God. You see, Gnostics, what they love to do, they love to have all these, these esoteric visions and, and all that. And Gnosticism itself means that they believe in salvation through hidden knowledge, arcane knowledge, mystery knowledge. In other words, they stretch back to Babylon and begin to pull the things that came from the watchers and from the Nehesh and from all these things and say that we can achieve salvation through those things. And they begin having these visions where they're, they're taken into the second and third and sometimes you read some of these things, the 15th heaven. I mean, they just start creating them out of thin air. You know, if Jim Bob down here went to the sixth heaven, I've got to go to the seventh to top him. And they begin, and, and all these esoteric experiences that they have, they begin changing the nature of who Jesus is. Out of these writings, there's a damnable gospel called the Gospel of Thomas. There's the Gospel of Mary and all these different ones that they had these divine revelations that counterdict the Word of God. In fact, what's interesting, in 1945, there, was, there were seven leather scrolls that was found in Upper Egypt. It's called the Nag Hammadi Library, and in it was the, was the Gospel of Thomas and many of these other things. What's interesting and perplexing to me is I'm beginning to see many Christians beginning to rely more on the, the, Hagma, uh, the Nag Hammadi more than they are the word of God and it's skewing who Jesus is. I see those in the Hebraic Roots movement, they, they want to sound profound and they want to sound mysterious so they reach into Kabbalah. Kabbalah is Jewish Gnosticism. It is mystery religion wrapped in Hebraic language and Hebraic imagery. It's the same thing. How about going back to Moses? How about going back to the Word of God and sticking with the Word of God? We have got to quit relying on this other junk because, Nicol because the Nicolaitans will do several things. It will lead you into spiritual idolatry. It will lead you into lasciviousness. It will lead you into both spiritual and sexual perversion. We need to best leave it alone. I'm just, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm frustrated and amazed at the same time. That so much of this stuff, you begin having so-called Christian ministers coming up with these revelations that they begin placing above the Word of God. If you have a, a revelation, it better agree with the Word of God or you had bad pizza or you had another spirit come visit you, and that they place it above the word of God. The second thing that we're warned about in the letters to the churches is the doctrine of Balaam. And in Numbers, if you read Balaam, he, he's an interesting character. He was basically a pagan Gentile that Almighty God came and would talk with every once in a while. He's an enigma. And I think the reason he is an enigma, because God was going to position him to speak something over Israel. Balak had, had, had paid him and paid him big time to curse Israel, and he tried, and you know, he had the, had the donkey event, and finally he gets up there, and his donkey doesn't get in the way, because he says, I'm going to give you more money. And, and the Spirit of God comes on him. He goes into a trance and he speaks the most beautiful blessing over Israel that has ever been spoken. In fact, to this day, the blessing of Balaam is read in every synagogue. 
And Balak got mad, said, you know what, I promised you. I promised you all this wealth. I promised you all this stuff. He says, now I can't say except that which God allows me to say. But then he says, you know how, how we can do this, don't you? And this is the doctrine of Balaam. You get God's people to sin, and God will not only take his hand off of them, he'll judge them. You let God curse them. And so in the next chapter, we have all these wild Midianite women come and begin seducing all the men. And the next thing you know, they're sacrificing to their gods. And there's all this sexual perversion and all these things going on. And let me tell you something, right now in America, the doctrine of Balaam is in full swing. The elite have been working on it for over 100 years. And one of the earmarks of it is hypersexuality. Have you noticed that, you know, you can go out to buy a, a pen to write with. See if I got one here. A pen to write with. And uh, New York advertising will say, well, if you can wrap enough sex around this pen, you can sell more pens. Isn't that the stupidest thing you ever heard of? They say, sex sells, sex sells. No, sex can lead you to hell if you get out of the boundaries that God said in his word. I heard one theologian one time say, besides salvation, Sex was God's second best idea. But with anything, if it's taken out of context or taken out of the boundaries that God sets it, it can destroy you. With the things that we have learned about soul ties and that we have a lot of Christians that have spiritually transmitted demonic disease, if you will, if I had, would have been told that when I was a kid, oh my goodness, wouldn't the things been different? But instead, we have people that simply can't keep their clothes on in and out of the body of Christ and don't really know they have, but they say, well, I've only done it five or six times. Yeah, but those five or six times with the people you did it, you have about a thousand soul ties. That all the spiritual junk that's in their life is coming to you. And it always goes into, it may start with the sexual sin, it may start with some other things, but it always goes into pagan worship. What's pagan worship? Worshiping anything but Almighty God. And they will have an absolute hatred for this word. Because it sets the boundaries by Almighty God and it points to who the Creator is and my responsibility to Him. Guys, it's time to do an inventory. If it is against the word of God, I'm against it. I will not allow it in my life. I'm not going to let the subtle seduction of Balaam's doctrines come into my life and take me away from God. How many ministers have fallen because they weren't on guard for Balaam? How many good husbands or good wives have fallen because they have not been on guard for Balaam trying to sneak into their lives? It will cut off your spiritual power and it will replace it with something else and you don't know before it's too late when the hand of God that you're trying to reach for for help ends up slapping you in judgment. The next thing, the fourth thing that we see in these books is persecution. Jesus didn't have any problems. I think it was the church in Smyrna, if I'm remembering, if I might be, I may not have that one right, but let's just, he said, you're, you're going to be persecuted for 10 days. Persecution right now. Persecution is there to get you to compromise. Now, how big a man or woman are you? Because the people of the 60s, remember all the, the rebellion and the riots and all these different things and all these rebels of the 60s, even though some of them were part of the weather underground and every other kind of underground you can think of, they never compromised. They just abided their time and pushed their agenda forth, and that's part of what we're living today. Now, they'll refuse to compromise, but how many Christians will compromise to get along with the world? I'm starting to do a spiritual inventory. Father, show me any place in my life where I've compromised. I'm not here to get along. I'm here to testify. I'm just a stranger moving through. One of the things that God had me put both in the life of faith, course, and we replaced it with covenant faith, is whatever you compromise to keep, you will always lose. 
And the truth is what the world is looking for is a people who refuse to compromise because it's real. If you have the real thing, you're not going to compromise with error. And how many know that in the Word of God and through Christ we have the real deal? Number five is Jezebel. Now, Jezebel is an interesting character because she loves to appear spiritual. She loves to appear hyper-spiritual. She presents herself in, in, in the book of Revelation as a prophetess. In fact, she even has a school of the prophets. But when you read the original Jezebel, she did. All her prophets became the prophets of Baal. Guys, not everything spiritual is of God. Not every supernatural manifestation is of God. Not everything that sounds spiritually deep is of God. It can be from the very pits of hell. We cannot have unity through signs and wonders because there's such a thing as false signs and wonders. We can't have it just because of the prophets because there's false prophets. In one of the churches, God even congratulated them saying, you tested men who said they were apostles and were not. Good job. Because there's a lot of people right now running around saying, and there are biblical prophets and apostles and pastors and evangelists and teachers in the body of Christ. But when people take it to its extreme and take it so far out of boundaries, there's 12 foundational apostles, and I consider Paul as the true replacement of Judas and is considered among one of the 12 as far as I'm concerned. That's the foundation. We always point back that, then we point back to the very first apostle. His name was Moses, one sent forth. And we stay true to them. Now, sometimes we'll call them senior pastors, sometimes we'll call them bishops, but they have this apostolic anointing. Titles don't matter, it's functions and faithfulness. But we've got to be careful because Jezebel's game is she likes power, she likes money. And what's interesting is she literally built one of the first ivory castles. She had a white castle and a black heart. Showing purity on the outside, but she was a daughter of Baal on the inside. That's one of the things Jezebel, Baal, means. She, she and her prophets will eventually lead the people into both sexual and spiritual fornication. Now, what spiritual fornication? Emalgamating pagan practices into the worship of God. As you become intimate with those other gods, which is spiritual fornication. You don't do that because you're going to end up, Jezebel will have you build a golden calf of some type or another and call it Yahweh. And then eventually, the, and the Bible it says it so politely, and they rose up to play. No, clothes were optional if I just need to go that far. They rose up and played like they did in Egypt. And the, the pagan gods were prostitutes were a part of those who served in the temple. We've got to be, so not everything, that's why we have to have discernment and you've got to know the word. If you don't know the word, little sparkly trinkets of the devil will lead you off on the wrong path. And how many times in the last several decades have we, saw, have we had so-called so -called experts say, this man is a prophet, this man is an apostle, and he ended up being a false one. And all this sin begins to be revealed. You're following after signs and wonders. You don't. You follow after the Word of God. And all the signs and wonders better point to Jesus and holiness and the integrity of God's Word and the reality of the kingdom. Are there false signs and wonders because they are signposts pointing to the wrong direction? False signs and wonders don't mean that they were faked. They can be supernatural manifestations that lead you away from God. The next one is the spiritually dead church. And that can speak to probably about 90% of the churches in America today. Revelation 3, 1 says, And unto the church, uh, unto the angel of the church at Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works, I know thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. 
Now, one of the first things that really sticks out to me in, in everything in Revelation, in every church, Jesus says, I know what you're doing. I got you, Peg Jack. I know everything that's going on. He can say the same for our homes. He knows everything that's going on. He knows what's going on in reality in the churches. He sees the power games and the politics that should never be in the church. And those jockeying for position in the church. He sees all that. And he can also judge all that. And I think that's the season we're, in, we're entering into he is going now he's getting ready to, to judge the world he's getting ready i believe to judge spot judge but there's a lot in the church that are going to go on that spot judgment too because they've not gotten right with him they have not heeded the letters to the seven churches and so i think we're going to be real surprised when the smoke clears what's left but he says you have this name that you're alive now, somewhere along the line, you were right, but you replaced all of it with meaningless ritual. Now, let me tell you something. I can point that to the high liturgical churches, and guys, I can say the same thing to much of the Messianic movement. God doesn't care if you parade a Torah around and you can say all this stuff in Hebrew if you don't have a passion for Jesus and living the Word of God and you simply place one dead ritual with another dead ritual. All you have is dead ritual. We're supposed to have a living relationship with the living God. We can set all that ritual aside. None of it matters. It's me being plugged into Jesus and him being my king and my Lord. And I'm walking in his ways in reality, not some vain ritual or paying someone else to do it for me. And because I went through this little thing over the weekend, I think I'm good all week long. No, you're not. You're deceived. All this is supposed to be is you getting your vitamins. I give you a vitamin pack, but you better be eating the rest of the week yourself. You've got to be digging your wells the rest of the week yourself. If not, you're going to find yourself in a mud puddle of the kingdom when you need to be in an ocean of God's grace. The last thing you want is God to come to you and say, you have this reputation that you're alive in the body of Christ, but you're dead. It's time to wake up, guys. The seventh one, the Laodicean church. I believe it's probably one of the most prophetic things. I see America in the seven churches right here. There is an Americanized gospel of prosperity. Now, does God want to meet your needs? Absolutely. But I guarantee you what? Bars of gold are not going to fall from heaven. Come on now. We have turned everything, and I believe in being generous. Mary and I are, are some, we, in the past, sometimes we've been a little bit more generous than we probably needed to be, but I would rather err on generosity than stinginess. But we have now have a gospel of you don't have to be obedient to God. You don't have to change your life to match the word. You just got to be able to write a check big enough to throw at it. And that your check, if it's big enough and you sow the right seed enough, it can, it can overcome your disobedience to God's word. Your disobedience, first of all, will kill any seed. Because that has to be given in obedience and from a position of obedience and not out of desperation because you disobeyed the word, disobeyed the word, disobeyed the word, didn't heed the spirit of God, and now you're in a jam and so you want to write out this big check and never have to change anything. I, I tell you exactly what God wants you to do. Stop right where you are, repent, and start backing yourself out and repent of every time that God showed you something or tried to get you to do something that you didn't do. You go back and repent and start doing it, and the Spirit of God will empower you to walk your way out of it. Now, he may have you planting seed, and he may have you doing things in during that term, but you can't stay here and be unrepented and not change your life and think if you could just write out a check big enough that you can get back where you're supposed to be. That is an illusion. That is the Laodicean church because where you end up is lukewarm. Just spiritual enough to be comfortable in Babylon. 
Because wealth can mimic spirituality in a Laodicean materialistic mindset. I walk with God, haven't you seen my Lexus? There are ministries today that say they walk with God, they show you big buildings, they will show you jets, they will show you cars, they, they will show you materialistic things. What, I, what, what really excites me when I go different places is when they start introducing me to people. Brother Mike, you see that girl over there? Yeah, she's a beautiful lady. What, what, you know, she used to be a crackhead and a teenage prostitute. She got saved, got cleaned up. She's now an attorney. She's now a mother of three with some of the most sweetest kids you'd ever want to see. Found a good godly man and married him. And they just love God with all. You see, that is the credentials. You can have a $3 million building and have 10,000 people going to hell. That building does not prove your credentials. You can be on every airwave of every television network on the planet, and that's not your credentials. Your credentials are the lives that were changed and the lives that begin to build their lives on the solid rock of Jesus Christ and on the solid rock of the word that are walking in God's ways. That this is who they used to be, but the gospel changed them. But who's getting all the, the bandwidth right now? The gospel changed God. And all you got to do is change what you do on Sunday morning. And now it's all about you because of grace, it's all about you. God wants you to have an Armani suit. God wants you to have this. God, wa God wants you to have salvation and to have a checkup from the neck up and have, your, and have your mind renewed to the word of God and get unplugged out of the glory of Lucifer because all these things can be taken away, but it doesn't change who a believer is. It doesn't matter if I, if today, if we had a $10 million building and we had studio after studio after studio, or we stay right here in this little building, it doesn't change who Mary and I are because Mary and I became this without any of that. All those are simply tools. Could you imagine going into a mechanic to work on your car and he shows you all the best tools that money can buy, but he doesn't know how to use a wrench? Your car sets there for weeks, and it sets there among all those tools, and it remains unchanged. He may give it a wax job, but it still won't run. That's the state of the Laodicean church. That when the push comes to shove, you got all the tools, you got everything you need, but you're doing nothing except spit shining the outside, and the car won't run. Right now, most of the church has aligned itself in America with Babylon. That's why I've quit messing with the church in general. I'm just after the remnant. And right now, there's a lot of remnant that are in bondage that need to be set free. There's a lot of people that God has predestined to be the remnant that aren't even saved yet. And I would rather deal with a hundred of them than one that's so steeped in the traditions of man in church that they're up to their eyeballs and you gotta, and you gotta work and pull them out of the mire of yeah. human doctrine. And they're fighting you the whole time trying to correct you when they're covered in the excrement of hell itself. And they're saying, there's nothing wrong with me, it's you. And they're trying to pull me in while I'm trying to pull them out. I'd just rather go get somebody that says, you know what? Jesus has saved me. i tell you right now, I was a scuzzball, and Jesus saved me. Now tell me how I can walk with Jesus. Oh, I want those so bad. They're not going to argue with you. Or my church says, well, there's a lot of churches right now that say a lot of things that will send you to hell and have you living for the devil right now. They're dead they're dried, they're plucked up, and they got Ichabod written over the doorposts. You ought to hear some of the stuff that I get emails about every single week in our office. Teaching our children the Word of God isn't true. 
I got one from missionaries that came back and said, what, what happened to the church? You know, we've been, we've been overseas for 10 years. We came back, we were doing a fundraiser. And they walked in, and here's children's church, and this children's pastor gets this big tub of water. He stands in it and says, I can't walk on water. Jesus didn't walk on water. That's a lie. I'm thinking, yeah, but you're about ready to get ready to fly. Somebody need to take a Bible and whip him upside the head with it and send him about 10 feet. And those little babies sitting there confused because they're told to read this, and then the whole time the ministries are telling them that this isn't true. It's an abomination. It's the Laodicean church. Many of the translations are the same way. And I, I, some, some people have a hard time with King James. I have finally found one that I can recommend that is a King James Plus. It's called the King James ER. King James, or I guess that would be King James Versioner. And all they've done, everything is word for word. Everything is, every verse is still there. They just simply took out the antiquated words like thee and thou and put you and me and I. And that's all they've done. Everything else is exactly the way the King James is. Except the antiquated language has been replaced. The first translation that doesn't try to remove things and to pervert things from the Word of God. So if guys out there, if you have a hard time with the KGV, I cut, I cut my spiritual teeth on this. This was my pacifier when I, was in, when I was a kid, and that's all I heard. If you have a problem with it, don't throw, throw away the NIV. It stands for the nearly inerrant version. And there's many, the, the, there's one called the Message Bible, which is too... <laughs> Two cents short of an abomination as far as I'm concerned. Get the KGVER. KJV. KGV. <laughs> IV. <laughs> we'll get, you know what I mean. What's the cure? One of the saddest things that I have found ever in the Word of God, and it's the saddest and the most exciting. Is Revelation 3 and 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Jesus, first of all, is on the outside of the Laodicean church, not on the inside. But really what he's talking about here is it is time to hammer out the ketubah, the marriage covenant. And he's the one in ascendancy here. He's the one who gives the terms, not us. You see, in a Jewish culture, let's say Mary and I are, are teenagers and we're dating and we thought we'd like to get married. She'll go talk to her dad. I'll go talk to mine. And then the dads get together and talk a little bit and they say, well, let's try this thing. And so there's an appointed hour. I and my father will go to Mary's door and knock. And her dad will look at him and say, you, you, you sure this is the guy? Because once we open the door, there is an obligation. Once you let Jesus in, there is an obligation. <laughs> oh, man, that'll preach. Once him and grace comes in the door, there's an obligation for you. Okay, let's open the door. He and his father come in. They sit down at a table. I will sit down and sup with you. He's talking about this little Jewish ritual. And so his dad says, son, tell him. I'm going to prepare a place for you in my father's house. Here's who I am. Here's what I'm called of God to do. Here is my destiny. Oh, all that sounds good. He's coming to ride by on a white horse. He's not going to need his troops, all the angels of heaven. All the saints that have ever went on before us, we're going to be sitting on white horses that day. We're going to be riding behind him, but we're there to bear witness that all the hordes of the Antichrist, the greatest army that has ever existed in the history of mankind, when Jesus meets them on the battlefield, he doesn't need any of us. We bear witness. And all he has to do is speak a word. The same God that spoke creation into existence speaks judgment. 
and they're decimated in an instant. I found out something that we do get to do. It's found in Psalms, Psalms 58. And this isn't in my notes, so just give me just a second. This, this was so radical when God showed it to me. Because, you know, we're there to bear witness. Psalms 58 is about the judgment of God. And I believe it's pointing because it talks about the day of his wrath. That's, that's Armageddon. That's the day of atonement. That's the day of the Lord. In verse 10 it says this, and the righteous shall rejoice when he seeth vengeance. There's only one day of the vengeance of our God. He will rejoice when he, we're bearing witness and we rejoice when the Antichrist and all his armies are decimated. The Bible says that blood will flow through the valley of Armageddon as high as a horse's belly. But it doesn't stop there. I had never seen this before and put the two together. And he, meaning the righteous, shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. You see, it's at that moment in verse 11, and God says, you will do this so that a man shall say, verily, there is a reward for the righteous. Verily, he is a God that judgeth in the earth. That's some rough medicine to take right there. But that's who we're supposed to be marrying. So after the father and the son get through describing all that they're supposed to do, we like to stop there. Glory to God, he's coming back for me. He's building a place. Oh, I just can't wait. I can't wait. What are you doing to prepare? I'm just looking. I just stare every day out my window. That's all you do day after day. And you, every once in a while you turn and says, it could just be any minute, Sister Mary. You don't understand the marriage covenant. Because when they get through, her family looks at the father and the son and says, okay, now based upon what you're called to do, what does she have to learn and what does she have to change to match you? From that moment on until the day that he returns to take her to his father's house, it's not about the wedding. In America, you know, it's, it's always about the wedding, and all of a sudden you have nice girls turn into bridezillas if you're not careful. It's not about the wedding. It's about the preparation to get to the wedding. The whole family helps on both sides to get ready for the wedding. But the thing is, she has a job to do that she must change herself and learn the expertise to walk with him and to be his right arm. The Apostle Paul says it this way, he is coming back for a bride with whose garments have no wrinkle and no spots. She's walking in holiness. She knows spiritual warfare. She walks the ways of God and she gives the devil hell every single day and, she's just, and she is a reflection in the earth. One day, the one that I serve and the one that I'm getting ready to marry is going to crush your head and right now he has called me to stand in his peace until the peace of God soon will crush Satan underneath my feet we're the ones who are supposed to be changing if we can change God he is not God he's a figment of our imagination how can perfection change how can absolute righteousness change the cross changed us we became new creatures. God didn't become a new creature. We had his Torah written on our hearts. We have his spirit now living in us. We have been sealed by the Holy Spirit to change us. If you're not changing and becoming more like Jesus, you're dying. That's just as simple as it can be. And I know God's timing for him to come back is soon, 
But I, I could see him looking at the father and says, can we wait a few more years, Dad? This woman looks more like she came out of Babylon rather than Jerusalem. She smells like Nimrod. She's running with Jezebel. She doesn't walk in my way. She walks not in the doctrine of Christ, but in the doctrine of Balaam. And Dad, she's sleeping around. Anything that sounds good that comes from another pagan god, she's willing to embrace and then fight to have it rather than to be obedient to the word. And here's the father's response. And this actually goes with writings in the early church. Well, son, maybe the only way that we can get her shaped up is to put her through persecution and tribulation. The early church fathers, many of them believed that the church would go through the tribulation period because it would take the tribulation to get them pure enough to be ready for Jesus. So here's our conundrum. God always says you can do it the easy way or the hard way. We can fall in love with him and purify ourselves or we can have persecution and tribulation do it the hard way. I choose option A. I'll change anything I need. I'll give up anything that I need. I tell you what, there's, I, I could give up everything in my life and it wouldn't be worth this knowing him and being used to him. All the junk, all the materialism stuff, it's tools. It doesn't define me. Used to. Mary will tell you back in the early years of computerization, she was a computer widow. Because I had to figure out how and why everything worked and why it worked, and I kind of gained, I kind of gained influence by being the computer guru of the area, which inev in inevitably ended me up being free tech support for everybody. I barely have time if, anymore. If you can't turn it on and it don't work, I don't have patience for it anymore because I've got stuff to do for the kingdom. None of that defines who I am. Nothing defines who I am except who I am in Christ and what I'm doing for him in the earth that he's commissioned me to do. Everything else can be laid aside. And I'm getting to the place right now, there's so much going on that I'm beginning to look for more things just to cast aside that I don't need. I'm, I'm kind of going through in my mind and to rearrange because it's about him, it's about his mission, it's about his purpose, and it's about his glory. And with all the interviews that I've been on, I don't care if they remember my name, but I want them to remember Jesus. And I want them to remember the reality of what Nimrod started and how it's all about taking, him, taking us away from the most gracious and loving and awesome God that created the universe and to discard Nimrod and to embrace Jesus. That's it. And I thank all of us in the weeks to come. This needs to be our kingdom response. While the world is wallowing in pig manure and getting mad at everybody that's not, our job is to become more holy, more righteous, more walking with God, disconnected from the world, in the world, but not of the world, because we have a higher purpose and we're connected to a higher kingdom, and to become more like him every single day. That's where life, that's where protection, that's where provision, that's where it all will come from, is based upon the closer, guys, you, the closer you get to God's throne, the closer the stuff of God's throne gets around you. You can't be a million miles away from the throne of God and expect his provision to reach you easily and his protection to reach you easily. The safest place is right in front of his throne, serving him and communing with him, and walking with him. And Father, this morning I ask that you would give us the grace that we would see the tactics of the enemy in every one of these seven letters, Father, let us be cognizant of them. Let's begin disarming the enemy and drawing closer to Jesus. Now, Jesus, I'll confess, 
that I and all the body of Christ has let one aspect or another of all these things affect us in our walks with you. And Father, we repent of these things right now. In the name of Jesus, we ask that the blood of Jesus would cover them. And Father, let our first love begin to burn brighter than anything else in our life and let it consume us to become a holy fire that can offer up a sacrifice of praise and worship and a life lived for you. And we just thank you and we praise you for it in Jesus' name.